So that's, it's, it's one of these great bits of our, this subject where I think it's Mr. Ross calls sort of drawing apart the curtains of ignorance as his method, as <coughs> one of his definitions of education. It's effectively what we're doing with physics, but we're, <laughs> unfortunately, to start off with, in terms of subatomic physics, you actually get the curtains pulled apart very, very small amounts. So you can only see a wee chink of the things that are made up of atoms and things like that. At higher, physics tends to be a little bit... I'm not saying that I or Mrs. Monroe are being more honest or not. I'm just saying that physics as a subject is being a little bit more honest. It says, well, OK, electrons do exist, yet you've got light that isn't really just this continuous stream of light like that. Light doesn't just come in continuous streams of energy. It is actually small bursts of energy. Each photon is nothing more than this wave packet. So a photon is a very good example of what's called wave-particle duality. The things can be a wave, yet they can also exhibit a particle like nature. So that's the idea. A photon is just this bundle of wave energy. And each of the photons is equal to Planck's constant times the frequency of the light that you're using. So the frequency depends, affects the energy. The, en the evidence for that is the photoelectric effect. That's what you did last year, so you could look back to your notes on photoelectric effect. What I'm going to come back to, the m a little bit more interesting, which sort of squares the circle of wave-particle duality, is when particles actually have wave-like behavior. Hi, I told you that Waves actually do have particle-like nature, but can you think of a particle which exists as a, or acts like a wave? An electron could be, Donald. Where would an electron behave as a wave? Well, I'll give you a clue. Have you heard of an electron microscope? Exactly. So scanning electron microscopes that are used for looking at um, things like this only work because... Electrons have wave particle, have wave particles. So if you've got things that can go through lenses and give you that sort of image by an electron microscope, then the electrons themselves must have wave properties. Otherwise, they couldn't be focused. They couldn't give an image. So how is it that electrons have a wave properties? What's the, from higher, what were you always told was the key test for things being a wave? Diffraction and, Chris? Interference. So if we can show that electrons interfere with each other, then there must be a wave. I'll give you an example. If we take two waves... Eh? Yes, yes, yes. If I had if this, if this was a big ripple tank here and got two, a wave generator here and there's waves coming out over here and these are small floating buoys that are indicating the amplitude of the waves, what would you observe if you were floating around at that buoy right down the middle of the two? Gaps. So these are waves coming in from a storm, like we had last week. These are the two gaps. Here's a, these are crests of water waves coming in like that. What would you note? What would you observe if you're at that buoy or anywhere along that line there? Yeah. Okay. Because you're getting what occurring where the two crests meet. So constructive interference down there. Similarly, these buoys over here are going to be getting a lot of very high up and down. Whereas where you've got peaks meeting troughs, peaks meeting troughs all the way down there, you'll end up with very little of the interference. So if we plot that out like that, you'd have a very high degree of amplitude here. That's constructive interference, destructive interference, constructive interference, destructive interference. If instead we just closed off one of the gaps, if we just had that, so we're now thinking about an electron gun, 
with electrons coming through here. And we're seeing what happens with electrons. Sorry, I'm going to go back a stage here. Let's just... Yeah, so if we did the same thing with electrons, where we had, instead of water waves, an electron gun here, and you've got the electrons spreading out if they are waves, and these electrons again spreading out as if they are waves, you can use a detector. This is a phosphor detector screen, just like the inside of a television tube. And you would get, if you only had one slit open, you would get a lot of electrons collected over here. If you only had the second slit open, you would get elect of electrons collected in over here. So instead of the boys, we're actually collecting electrons like sort of ball bearings into a bucket here. So we're getting much more here, because that's near a slit two. A few more over here, because that's near a slit one. But the strange thing is, with the electrons, you would think that if you have both slits open at the same time, you're going to have, what, three and two, so you'd have five in there, four and two, you'd have six in there, four and two, six, so you'd have more or less six or seven or five all the way across there if you started collecting up all those electrons from the two gaps into these electron buckets. It's not what's observed. If you have a thin slit there, electrons coming through, individual particle electrons, the same electrons that you have going around the wire, the same, these things that have that mass, have that charge, when you actually collect up with the two slits going together, that's what you observe. The intensity changes. The intensity you notice here is constructive interference. Here you end up with no or very few electrons captured. Here, you again, you end up with a maximum of electrons. The electrons have this wave behavior where as soon as they are not just individual electrons, but as a group, they exhibit this wave interference. So that's an example of the... Uh, Right there. You can do the same thing with with light and you'll get the same results and also with electrons using a photon detector as well. Just like that one is. So So the evidence for the electrons is that you can get this electron diffraction, where if you have electrons going through a gap, then they will diffract and they will cause interference. So if we just add that in underneath there. So the, the double slit, they actually cause interference between the two. Now the, some of the evidence for photons behaving like particles is what you get with the Sorry, I've jumped a bit here. So that's the... If you... These are actual images of individual electrons going through double slits with uh, each dot is one electron getting through the double gap. 
with only half a dozen electrons through, you end up with them fairly randomly spaced like that. So they're behaving as particles. As soon as you allow a few more through, again, they're still fairly random. There's not a lot of pattern appearing there. But the more and more electrons that you use, they start to form themselves into these interference bands. For some reason, the electrons are not appearing here. Do it more often, and you're getting very definite interference bands. All the electrons are going here, none are here. All the electrons are going here, none here. And the electrons do this because they have a wave property. And in fact, anything which is a particle has a wave property. The only reason that we notice it with electrons is electrons are very small and they're moving very fast. The bigger something is and the slower something is, that effect is much less marked. But anything as a particle will have this wave property. And if anything is moving as a wave, if something's moving as a wave, what could you measure about the object's motion? You've got a wavelength. So any moving object, be it an electron, be it a piece of chalk, it's got its own wavelength. And the wavelength was, equation was, first of all, worked out by a Frenchman called Louis de Broglie. And this is the gentleman here. So Louis de Broglie, um, it's written de Broglie, but you can really work out those people who have, sort of have learned their physics from actually hearing about it rather than reading about it because those people say de Broglie or de Broglie. So and he, yeah, Prince Louis de Broglie, he was actually quite a, um, a nobleman. Um, so his grandfather had died on the French guillotine. So he was of this sort of noble descent, um, but he was a very talented physicist and he got the Nobel Prize in 1929, as it says there. The equation is that the wavelength of something moving is related to the Planck's constant, 6.6 .6 times 10 to the power minus 34, and the momentum of the, of the object that you've got. So I'll put that up on the board for you. Yep. Okay. And this is for absolutely any particle with any mass with the de Broglie wavelength is h over mv. So that's going to give you a wavelength in meters. That's 6.6 .6 times 10 to the power minus 34 joule seconds. That's the mass in kilograms. That's the speed in meters per second. So we'll, we'll do a couple of examples to work out why we've never noticed this before. Well, there again. Some people, as they're walking down Academy Street, do sort of, if you probably see this better from, 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 stride, from front on here, that people have been known to have a sort of wavelength as they're walking along Academy Street at sort of 2 o'clock in the morning. Yes, some of you know what I'm talking about. So let's just try a couple here. Firstly, for a 20-gram bullet, if, you, if that's traveling at just over a double the speed of sound... Um, that is moving very fast, but it's very light. Maybe that's going to have a, a wavelength. So let's just try that one now. So do you need to take into account the wavelength of a bullet? If you just try that yourselves, what's going to be the wavelength for that bullet traveling at 500 meters per second? 